Now I would like to invite Professor Govinda Raju to uh, start the first lecture, which is on concentration and the flux definitions. Professor Govinda Raju. Well, thank you, Professor Jay. Uh, I'm very glad to be here and you know, be part of this collaboration with the colleagues from IIT Kanpur. And I hope you know, this will lead to further collaborations. I also want to thank all of you and welcome you to this, uh, uh, to this course. Uh, the topic is one that you know, is of great interest to me. And some of us have been PhDs on, on that topic. And it continues to be very relevant. And every time I try to teach it, or do something, I learn something new. I'm not taught this course in a while ago, so this is a good opportunity for me to you know, get back into this. And I'm sure I'll discover new things or mistakes that I have made in the past that I need to correct going on. It's a continual learning, learning process. Uh, all of us have different uh, lecturing styles, and my style, I usually frequently ask questions. I want you to be engaged. If, you're going to, if I'm going to award to our lectures, all my lectures will be finished in 10 minutes, and then we won't know what to do the rest of the time. So please feel free to interrupt me or ask me questions. I'm going to be ask you how do I follow this? Yes, question. actually, we have this, uh, this thing you want to tell. If you want, uh, you know, some of them can also be fine. So, we have only an attempt in transport, and we all have uh, perhaps uh, have some exposure to it at some time. How many of you have had a course in contaminant transport of some sort? How many of you have had courses in Laplace and Fourier transforms? Nobody. I can't believe it. Somewhere in your math background, especially in India, where math tends to be a strong suit, you must have had Laplace and Fourier transforms in your undergraduate education. Uh, I remember an undergraduate student, I used to be very impressed with Laplace, Laplace transforms. When I became a graduate student, my respect for Fourier you know, rose considerably because you know, what he did with Fourier transform, especially with fast Fourier transform, is phenomenal. Uh, so you must have done a course on Laplace and Fourier, but on so, in some of your courses you must have studied somewhere yeah. a little yeah. bit of, uh, some, some little bit of uh, these transforms they must have done. So, uh, what we want to do with this course is essentially introduce you the idea of moment analysis. Moments are something that we deal with, in fact, many subjects, starting perhaps in our earliest exposure, we talk about moment of inertia when uh, we are doing our mechanics courses. From there, and then it has a, a applications in turbulence and many others, including contaminant transport. And what we'll do is explore this concept of moments in contaminant transport problems. How many of you have heard of moments? But some of you. And what we want to do is essentially show you that uh, when we do moment analysis, it's a very elegant way of trying to understand contaminant transport behavior. And what we also want to show is using Fourier transforms, and in this case perhaps more often Laplace transforms, how we are able to cleverly link these two through moment analysis. If you remember the Laplace transform and Fourier transforms, you have an equation, you take a Laplace transform, you get a simpler equation, then you take the inverse, you do all that. We want to avoid all that. We want to take the Laplace transform and directly get moments. And uh, so people before before all of us have done this very cleverly, and then that subject has done that. But before we do all that, uh, I wanted to start with some very basic things, definitions. And definitions are important because when I learn contaminant transport from different people, from people from soil physics, or people from civil engineering, or people from geotechnical engineering, or people from earth and atmospheric sciences, they use the same terms but mean something completely different. So we don't have the uh, uh, same common language. So part of our goal with this first talk is to essentially see if we can at least come to some understanding about some of these definitions. So let's start uh, with a sort of basic motivational slide. Why do we study solute transport? So what this picture is trying to show us is, you know, if you have essentially a subsurface region uh, saturated below the water table, unsaturated above, if there is a contaminant source, 
and depending on the nature of the contaminant, the unsaturated zone it may move generally vertically downwards, and then once it reaches the groundwater, it essentially is going to move and develop into this very diffuse plume, which is very very difficult to characterize. And then, if we have a very strong experimental program, what we try to do is essentially place sensors, you know, along where we think the plume is going to be passing through, and try to collect measurements. And we try to characterize this plume. We see where it is now, and if we are really clever, we see where it's likely to be in the future. So all of these measurements are therefore needed. And many times, we are rarely interested in what is the contaminant concentration at one particular location, at one particular time. We are more interested in things like, well, let's say this translate CC is a controlled plane. We know that there's a source over here. What we want to know is how much contaminant is crossing that plane. What is the mass fluxes? How long are they going to persist? These are the kinds of questions that we ask. So various reasons why we do contaminant transport is to model freight and transport of contaminants as they move from some source location to some receiving location, which could be the groundwater table, it could be some control plane, or it could be some boundary where you are trying to establish some sort of a control or remediation strategy. Uh, what we also want to do is, as the contaminant moves, it's going to be reacting with the media. And depending on the nature of the contaminant, depending on the media, there will be lots of mechanisms, physical, chemical, and perhaps biological mechanisms that essentially act to change the fate of this contaminant that is moving along, change its properties perhaps. And to be able to, we want to try and understand all that. Sometimes the byproducts of the contaminants are far more toxic than the original contaminant that we were worrying about. So we want to understand these kinds of problems. And more importantly, we would like to be able to design and assess remediation strategies. If we want to clean up the site, what should our strategy be? How effective are we likely to be? How much fraction of the mass that we think is there are we likely to recover? So these are the kinds of questions that usually motivate us to study contaminant transport. This is, and I'm sure you, know, you can think of many other reasons. I could almost point out that moment analysis, especially for the kinds of problems, is almost worth studying because the mathematics is so elegant. <laughs> but you know you have to be specially spe motivated to do that. So in any case, uh, what I also like about this is the math is, uh, I'm going to say reasonably simple. There's a lot of math, but it's all linear. At least I've chosen to keep it all linear problems. And linear problems obviously lend us lots of tools. Non-linear problems, we, we tend to be more limited. So some basic definitions, like I said, we we'll start with some basic <coughs> definitions, and I'll try and uh, tell you why I think these are very important as we go along. So this is just a conceptualization, a sketch of, let's say, a block of soil. I'm taking a look at the cross section, and the soil, as we know, it will consist of solid soil particles. Let's say the other brown particles. And the rest of it is void space, which may be occupied by water, which is uh, light green, right? Mm -hmm. My slide is blue or it might have some other void spaces with air pockets and so on. So it's a very complicated medium, very complicated medium. So solid phase consists of all the soil particles, voids. The rest of the space typically is occupied by water, which we will use as our solvent. It may be air. We will not be talking about oils which do not mix in water. That would multi-phase flow, immiscible flows. What we are going to be worried about is mostly contaminants in this course at least, which dissolve in water. And that there are low enough concentrations that we don't have to worry about precipitation and all those effects. So first definition that we will use is water content. Again, this is fairly basic stuff, but I, I want to get us started with this. So water content, we we'll, we'll typically use the symbol theta. So it's going to be volume of water by bulk volume of the soil. So if I have a soil block, if I see if I can compute the volume of water divided by the bulk volume, that is my uh, definition for theta. Similarly, air content is volume of air divided by bulk volume of soil. Okay. Porosity, we will typically use the symbol eta, which is volume of all the voids divided by bulk volume. 
and uh, of course if the medium were completely saturated it means all the pore space is occupied by water the air phase has, has no role to play then the air content if you will is zero and the porosity and the water content are essentially the same thing. So these are some basic definitions to sort of help us uh, get started. Okay, so my first question then, since many of you have had courses in contaminant transport is what is concentration? And I think when I started take, or learning about this, I was surprised that I got stuck at this point and it took a while for me to figure out what is going on. So concentration means many things to different people I guess it's most important is what is it that we are measuring. So let's say this is my soil block again, and let's say we have solute, some solute, some contaminant which is in the soil block. So if I take a syringe okay, and essentially insert it through the soil, and the syringe is essentially sampling the soil solution. So if I insert a syringe and essentially pull the solution in, it's only going to pull the solution that's there in the water phase, let's say. And then I can bring this to the lab and basically analyze it for and say, you know, get rid of all the water, find out how much solute was there, and uh, measure a concentration. So that concentration we'll call as a resident concentration. It resides in the fluid. And Typically, we'll be using the symbol C sub R, and my definition is mass of solute by volume of solution. So mass over LQ. However, this volume, I want to emphasize, is volume of solution. So this is what you have done. You have taken a syringe, removed the solution, and found that. Similarly, if I could essentially go to an individual soil particle, and I can find out how much solute match it mass is attached to the soil particle. Either it's very held fairly tightly on the surface, or some of it might have even absorbed into the soil, into the solid <coughs> soil particle. But whatever, let's say it's attached or associated with the solid phase, we will call that a solid phase concentration. Typically use the symbol capital S, which is mass of solute by mass of dry soil. It doesn't have the same units, it's mass over mass different concentration then if I if I have air phase and let's say the contaminant that I have volatilizes fairly easily then some of the solute is residing in the air phase in the vapor phase so if I could essentially sample only the air phase and see how much concentration is there I could define an air phase concentration which is C sub air and that's mass of solute by volume of air so if you're dealing with volatile compounds, this becomes fairly important. So all of these are concentrations, but they are very different. You cannot add any of them up. Even though C sub R and C sub air both will have the same units of mass over length Q, they are not additive. One is mass over volume of solution. This is mass over volume of air, and this is mass of solute divided by mass of dry soil. So these are all concentrations, but it depends on what it is that you are measuring in your experiment. And later on, we'll find out that your governing differential equation, the boundary conditions that you set, also depend on what it is that you are measuring and how, what it is that you are doing in your experiment. Then we'll define something called bulk concentration. And bulk concentration, or sometimes called as total concentration, what we are doing is we take a block of soil and we bring it to the lab and we use some fractionation technique, find out all the mass that is there in the block of soil, irrespective of whether it was water, whether it was solid, soil particles, whether it was air, we don't care. In that bulk volume of soil, we got rid of everything else and found out a total mass of soil that was there. We'll call that as bulk concentration, C C sub B. So mass of solute by bulk volume. So again mass over length Q, but this is bulk volume of the soil. So which is has different units from resident concentration, has different units from all the other concentration. You know they all look like mass over L Q. They are not the same units. And we will be very deliberate about uh, about this throughout the course. 
So how do we relate all this? The, the expressions are fairly simple. So C sub B is the mass of solute. So if we have a resident concentration and theta is the water content, so in the entire bulk volume, theta times C sub R gives you the mass of solute as a resident concentration. Similarly, if rho sub D is a dry bulk density of the soil, the mass of soil in the bulk volume that is associated with the solid phase is rho sub D times S. A is the air content. A times this quantity gives you the mass of solute in the entire bulk volume, but that is associated with the air phase. And if I were to add all of these, that would give me the total bulk concentration. So if you basically take a soil sample, bring it to the lab, use some technique which gets rid of everything and only measures entire solute, it gives us C sub B, but it doesn't tell us what part of it is in C sub R or C sub A or what is S. So all of these concentrations are different and like I said, depending on what experiment you are doing and what it is you are measuring, you are measuring the resident concentration in some parts, you are measuring the bulk concentration somewhere else. So you have to be very careful what it is that you are measuring and so that you can model it you know, carefully. My first question, so we talked about quite a few concentrations already. Are you aware of any other concentrations? This is one of the most important concentrations that we deal with, we haven't talked about yet, so we will come to that. But before we do that, we have to essentially revisit some other concepts that have to do with porous media. So after concentration definitions, I talk about flux definitions. Again, you would have seen this before, but for completeness sake, let's do this. And this is essentially a sketch of, let's say, a soil. I'm looking at a soil section. Let's say it's a rectangular section just for ease of understanding. I want to talk about fluxes. Okay. Fluxes, again, depending on how, you know, where you have seen it, we are interested in essentially how much of an extensive property is causing a given cross-section area. So that is my idea of a flux. So I basically make a sketch for myself. And this is essentially a small, let's say, unit cross-sectional area in the soil. And what I'm interested in is, how much flux is crossing that particular cross-sectional area. And so I, I'll start with this simple sketch. When I blow up that unit cross-section area, essentially, and let's say it's completely saturated, we'll keep it easy. That cross-section area, part of the cross-section area is occupied by solid soil particles. Rest of it is occupied by water. And let's say we are thinking primarily 1D flow so that the arrow essentially gives you an idea of which way the water is moving in this porous media. So if I could actually measure all the velocity vectors at all the poles, it would be some random combination of local velocity vectors. You know, the poles, poles are very tortuous. Then you have no slip boundary conditions so that water attached to the pool is at zero velocity. Somewhere in the middle has higher velocity. They're going in all different directions. So the flow is actually very complex, very, very complex. And what we want to do is somehow capture all this complexity and make it simple for typical use. I'll essentially boldly or very, let's say, uh, initially casually define something which I'll call as an average velocity vector, or let's say some sort of a resultant velocity vector, which is, you know, a loose definition is if for all these velocity vectors which are going everywhere, I think this is my resultant velocity vector. I don't quite know what that means. Many PhD theses have worked on this and haven't quite resolved this problem yet. So it is a very complicated problem. So I want to essentially then define, so this lecture is all on definitions, a Darcyian flux. What I mean by Darcyian flux is, if this is my cross-section area, the total volumetric water that is crossing this cross-section area is Q so many meter cube per second or so many centimeter cube per hour. I define it with this bulk area, A, and I get Q. So that is volumetric water flux per unit area, Q over A, which is small Q. So that is Darcyan flux. It tells me what is the water flux that uh, I'm seeing here. I'll define something called seepage velocity. I'll use the symbol V 
So this is the volumetric water flux divided by let's say active flow area because when I looked at this entire area that which is what I was using for this definition I noticed that not all the area actually has flow. You know, in some of the area cross sections where you have a solid soil particle the velocity vector is actually zero. So I loosely define an active flow area and I'll be even more bold and say that if this is the area A, the active flow area is theta times A. Where theta, if you remember, was our definition for the water content. And again, this is something that we professors worry about. There are all kinds of assumptions that have already gone into it, which we, we rarely visit. Notice that this is a cross-sectional area, okay? whereas theta was by definition a volume definition. The volume of water divided by bulk volume. Theta for a volume for the same medium versus theta for an area are actually different. They don't have to be the same. And only there are some kinds of porous media where the aerial porosity and the volumetric porosity will be the same. So those definitions that you see will not hold for all porous media. Again, a fairly deep and complex topic, but we will go with this and say, you know, this is my working definition. So I'll define this as a seepage velocity. I want to also now notice that the Darcian flux has units of length over time. The seepage velocity has also units of length over time. They are not the same thing. Firstly, Darcian flux is never a velocity. Some people use the term Darcian velocity and, and I do not know whether they are talking about Darcian flux or seepage velocity, but it's not, it's a flux. This is perhaps a velocity seepage velocity, at least it has a definition of a velocity. And you know, now I'll define something else, solute flux, which we will do for solute transport. So solute flux we will define in this form. So the Q was water flux, we had a subscript S to make it solute. So solute mass flux divided by the bulk area. Solute mass flux is just this was volumetric flux, so many centimeter cube per second. This is so many grams per hour. So mass divided by time. So that much mass of solute in a given time is crossing this cross-sectional area. And if I divide that by the total, by the bulk area, A, this ratio is solute mass flux per unit area. So if this were a unit area, what we are defining Q sub S is the amount of mass that is crossing this area in a given unit of time. Everybody with me so far. But everything revolves around how we define this, everything that follows. My first question to you is this average velocity that we sort of loosely talked about, what do you think that is most close to? Anybody? So this average velocity. If you, know, if you have to make a guess, the closest thing that you can say is equal to the sequence velocity. But even that is not very clear, but just uh, this is what we'll be using as we go along. So at the local or the microscopic scale, it's very complex for us to do, be able to do many useful things. We look at it from a larger picture and make these definitions to essentially work with them. So solute flux mechanisms. Uh, again, now this you will have seen because we have talked about some of these definitions. Let us talk about diffusion, stationary liquid, which means the liquid is not moving. <coughs> so we have essentially still water, but even in still water, what we know is at the molecular level, because of random vibrations of molecules, you know, so the liquid still, uh, there is still some spreading that goes on. So for instance, if this is a porous medium, and a porous medium will introduce extra complications, but my same sketch of a porous medium, and if at time t equals zero, let's say I introduce a solute at a certain location, and just for convenience, I define myself a coordinate axis, so this center over here is the same as what it is over here, then at time t equals zero, I have certain mass, so therefore a certain concentration, which I have introduced at this location. And because of random molecule vibration, the fluid is not moving, it's stationary. After a certain time, 
what I see is this the solute because it's dissolved in water slowly occupies a larger region, it has spread, it has become less concentrated. And if I were to try and plot the concentration along the same transect, initially over here it was this, it has spread a little so you get a different shape. And uh, similarly, at a later time, it will have essentially you know, gone and occupied a larger area. So this is essentially what you would call as diffusion. And what we, what we use is something called Fick's law. And we will assume that Fick's law is true for solute diffusion. And this is the, our mathematical expression. There will be little particular of what concentration we use. Fick's law says that solute diffusion flux, so much mass across in a unit area, is going to be given by this expression. D sub m is the coefficient of molecular diffusion. This is the spatial derivative of the resident concentration with distance. So we'll look at it in one dimension first. Tau is tortuosity. And that's because we're dealing in a porous medium. It's not a free, free liquid. Tortuosity will be less than 1. And what we imply by tortuosity is if I have a solute particle there, and by the time it goes a certain distance, it has taken a very tortuous path. Whereas, the distance delta z that we are measuring, when I'm going from that location to location, is a straight line distance. So I'm thinking the change has occurred over delta z, but the actual travel path is much more tortuous and longer. And therefore, my diffusion coefficient is reduced by a certain amount to try and, try and capture this. And that is what we call as tortuosity. BM is molecular diffusion in the free liquid. And Z, of course, is a spatial coordinate. Anybody wants to know why is the negative sign? So we define all the others. Why the negative sign? High concentration. High concentration to low concentration. That is correct. What's that? Concentration gradient. Concentration gradient. That is also correct. I guess it's a matter of, fundamentally, it's a matter of notation. When we say del C, del Z, we think of that as a positive quantity if C is increasing in the Z direction. That's our definition in calculus. We want the flux to be moving in the Z direction against a concentration gradient, so we put a negative sign so that the calculus works out. And your answer is correct. It is moving from a higher to lower concentration, which according to calculus convention is a negative sign okay, for, for the gradient. Solute flux mechanisms. Let's talk about, so that was diffusion very quickly about advection. We'll first talk about pure advection. What do you mean by pure advection? Same fluid, but now it is actually moving. It's not stationary. And let's say we have a seepage velocity that we talked about in this direction. So same idea, we introduce some solute. And at time t equals 0, we introduce it all at, that, at the origin. At some later time, all that has happened is it has moved from here to a certain different different location, simply move translation. There's no change. Whatever the concentration was with the fluid, it moved to a different location. That is pure direction. It's moving completely because of velocity. And at some other time, it will have moved to a different location. So this is our understanding of pure direction. It doesn't happen, especially not in porous media, but it's a very good approximation. It allows us to do many other things in porous media also. So this also causes mass flux. There is no uh, fixed law or anything in this. All it says is Q is because of advection. If Q is a Darcyian flux, then the solute flux by advection is Darcyian flux times the resident concentration. But Q, the Darcyian flux, was theta times V. V is the seepage velocity. That was our definition. So this is by advection. By far, perhaps, the most complicated notion is dispersion. So we come back and we again have a, have a porous media where the fluid is moving at a certain <coughs> velocity. We again have the same starting condition. But at a certain later time, what we see is not only has it moved, but it has also spread. And so the, the solute mass was initially over here, now it has moved somewhere to the right and there is a concentration distribution. And at some later time, it has spread some more and has moved more to the right. 
So this is, we try to encompass all this through the idea of dispersion, which is also a fairly complex topic. But in, in simple expression, what we try to do is lump advection and dispersion. So this was the advective part. Dispersion, we try to model it or we try to express it mathematically as if it's speaking. <coughs> or we use the same derivative definition. We think dispersion also occurs proportional to the gradient in the resident concentration. And theta is, of course, the water content. These dispersion from velocity fluctuation. So this is not the molecular diffusion model. The velocity dispersion basically occurs, and again, it's very complicated because if we are going from one location to the other, I start with a certain solute mass. And with time, part of that mass will be taking all these different pathways. Notice that the local velocity vectors number are going in all directions. So some of the velocity carries the fluid part of the solute somewhere else, some of it carries it somewhere else, some of it carries it somewhere else. There's all this spreading going on because of velocity fluctuations. So eventually, the solute has spread over a much larger region, far larger than the spreading that would have got from molecular diffusion. Because as the fluid is moving, it's actually advection, but it is doing it in such a dispersed manner that we lump it as dispersion. So that is dispersion. And we use this particular model for it. So total solute flux is going to be advection, dispersion, and molecular diffusion. All of these added together. So you know, one of the examples that I use or try to explain to myself is, you know, when I'm having coffee in the morning, I put coffee, I'll put a cube of sugar. And if I don't do anything, the sugar will eventually distribute throughout the coffee by diffusion, but I might have to wait till the evening. Coffee would have gone cold by then. What I do, or what we all do, is we take, take a spoon and mix it. And that causes the sugar to mix much more rapidly. We mix it one direction, then we go in the other direction to create a lot more mixing. What we are actually doing is inducing a lot of velocity with randomness to do all this mixing. And that is what dispersion does. So we actually do dispersion every day we drink coffee, but we don't think about it. So, however, it's a very complex process. Our simple representation, which allows us to do a lot of things, you know, solve a lot of problems, therefore says that the total solute flux Q sub S, this was essentially advective, advective flux, this is a dispersive flux, and this is the diffusion, molecular diffusion flux. Notice that these two have essentially this derivative with their proportion of the gradient in the resident concentration, so we lump both of these. And we call this as hydrodynamic dispersion, or dispersion coefficient. And that is going to be our definition. So this capital D essentially lumps a lot of things. The advective part is what we can sort of measure. Let's say we can measure Gaussian flux. We can divide by the area and get an ideal sequence velocity. Dispersion is much more difficult to measure, much more difficult to characterize. It's almost in, in some uh, mathematical frameworks, all that we know is advection. Everything that we do not really know very well is part of dispersion. So it's much more complicated to model. But in this construct, it allows us to do a lot of, uh, address a lot of problems. Any questions so far? So in the first slide, you, you mentioned that uh, in nine times such methods, you know, the flow is essentially the thing. Could be. Could be. Yes. It, it's not a flow always. No. Can be that Yes. Yes. No, it's not. Yeah. Go ahead. Yes. Now, how can you, how can you measure this hydrodynamic dispersion coefficient? How do you measure it? Yes. Uh, I think there is no. There is no direct measurement. You basically, well, the, the simple answer is with that calculator. We essentially try to see how much the plume has spread. You know, I will perhaps do this when we talk about moments and so on. And then we fit this equation and see which value we will fit the data with. That is our estimate of dispersion. It's a little complicated, like, and that's a good question. Part of our discussion will be on that. Dispersion, we don't directly measure it. We try to back calculate it by fitting models. 
and depending on which model you choose, you'll get a different value of B. <coughs> so it's, it's a calibration. It frequently becomes a calibration instrument. The direct measurement of B is uh, very difficult because, like I said, at the local scale, at the poor scale, none of us really know what is happening. What we are able to measure are macroscopic properties, and therefore we, we are able to you know, say something about them. But fundamentally, uh, it's difficult to do dispersion. What we try to do is try to relate how we can characterize dispersion to velocity fluctuations, because we think that is what is causing this major spreading. The velocity fluctuations, in turn, are caused because, you know, at some scale, because the porous media is heterogeneous. Even within the post, there are some places where velocity is pool velocity is higher, where it's some other places where it's lower. In a heterogeneous field, you have regions where the conductivity is higher. So with scale and how much heterogeneity you have, dispersion becomes a very difficult thing. So what we try to understand is what is scale dependence of dispersion and so on. So that becomes a theoretical topic. But dispersion in general is not an easy, easy thing to put your hands around. So like I said, sometimes my thinking is whatever we don't know, we say, okay, let's put that in dispersion. <laughs> because we are not able to easily characterize it. There, I don't think there is any direct measurement. Uh, but about the diffusion coefficient, it is more easy to calculate. You said the diffusion coefficient too. But that depends on uh, the solute, the type of solute. Yes. But All uh, these will depend on some degree on type of solute. But about the dispersion coefficient, that depends on the medium. I think all of them will depend, depend both on the medium and the solid. So diffusion coefficient is also equally difficult to measure? Uh, yes, I mean, not equally difficult, it's much easier to measure. Yes. Much easier to measure and uh, the conceptualization is a little simpler because the medium for pure diffusion, where you don't, so soil is much more complex, but if I'm doing pure diffusion water or pure diffusion air, I don't have this tortuosity thing to worry about. So that makes it actually quite simple. So we can characterize it, we can calculate it, we can compute it, but usually we are given, we have made measurements, and we try to back calculate what value of dispersion would make that model work. So basically we calculate what are called as effective properties. And what we learn is depending on which model you choose to use, you'll get a different effective value. So speaking theoretically, uh, is this tortuosity the ratio between the exit ratio of these particles, the straight path and the, the curved path? It is some measure of the average of that ratio, yes. Because between two points, the straight line distance is the same, but different particles will take very different tortuous paths. So each of these particles will have different tortuosity. I need to get some estimate of what the average tortuosity is to be able to use that equation. So yes, it is a ratio of the straight line distance to a tortuous path, but some average of that ratio. All right. Any? I basically left you with one question. Do you know any other concentrations? No, no, no. What was the other one? Radiant light decay or product, but there are still concentrations. Any other concentration, any other concentration that you actually measure quite easily or measure most of the time? All right, I want to keep things fitting there. Oh. Well, maybe that was the last slide. It is in the last slide. Like maybe I don't have the most recent one, yeah, in which case I'll use the pen. Yeah. So, let me. So basically, we define Q sub S. That is the last slide? Oh, no, I think it's the last slide. But there was some. Yeah, All right. So Q sub S, remember we say that is theta V resonant concentration. So we will define something called a flux concentration. That's Q sub S over Q. This is a solute flux. This is the water flux. 
q sub s over q, based on how we have denoted that q, was actually theta times v. So this is c sub r. It's called the flux concentration or the flux average concentration. And the reason it's very important is because this is the quantity that we most often end up measuring. If you are doing a soil column experiment, which is where we do most of our experimentation, we essentially have a soil column and water continues to flow freely and then we essentially add solid to the top. At the bottom, as water is coming out, we collect a certain amount of water, which has solid mix in it, bring it to the lab, measure the concentration. Then again, collect some more water, measure the concentration. So what is coming out is Q sub S, the solute flux, which is crossing the cross-section area from the bottom. And we are measuring Q, the flow rate. And in the lab, what we measure, therefore, is this ratio. So in that volume, which was collected over a period of time, so much solute flux passed the bottom of the column. And that was the volume of water. That ratio is also a concentration. That is called a flux average concentration. And this is C sub F is what we measure, which is actually very different from C sub R, which of course is very different from C sub B. And so the theories that we develop, you know, if I'm essentially doing column experiments, collecting measurements from the bottom of a column, I essentially use C sub F. All my model formulation boundary conditions should ideally be in terms of C sub F. What I should also know is, you know, how is C sub R useful? How is C sub F useful? How do we link these two? What do moments mean in all this context? This is what we'll find out through the rest of the rest of the course. I'm going to stop here and see if you have any questions. Concentration is the same as the rest of the concentration. So, the C sub F, what we'll call as a flux average concentration. So, uh, Remember when we are talking about this, I said where is there's one more concentration that we use a lot. So what are we doing? We are measuring the Darcian flux. So from the bottom, if I do a column experiment, let's say this is the bottom of the column. I essentially have water mixed with solute coming out continuously. Over a certain period of time, I basically collect the solution, see the volume, and that is my Darcian flux, volume of water divided by this bulk area. I then take this water, get rid of all the water, evaporate all it out, solute mass is left. So in that particular time, that much mass of solute has crossed this bottom of the column. That is what we have called a solute flux. The ratio of these two, what I do is I say, okay, this is the mass of solute, which is there in this much volume of water. So mass over volume, I express that as a concentration. But that is not resident concentration. It's not bulk concentration. It is flux average concentration. You are taking Q sub S divided by Q. So that is the flux average concentration. So when we do column experiments, and this is what we are doing, we have effectively measured the flux average concentration, which is therefore different from you know, the other concentrations. So how do we incorporate physically the physical What's that again? Okay. So if, <coughs> if I understand your question, <coughs> if there is solid that is attached to solid phase or if it's a solid with a vapor phase, where is it being accounted in this model? Is that correct? Yes. So that is what we will learn in, in, in perhaps the next lecture, where we actually develop the control volume thing and do the equation. Uh, and we'll, we'll develop what we we'll call as continuity equation for solute. That is where it would all come up. The, and, and we'll look at various other models, and you'll see where essentially the 
I'm not sure we'll do much of air phase, at least in my notes, I didn't have anything in air phase, but we'll understand more about solid phase concentrations and, and how they occur. But when we do these kinds of experiments, notice that the water that's coming out with the, sol the solvent that's coming out of the solute, it only has liquid phase concentrations. I mean, assuming there's no air that we're talking about. So the amount, the flux that is being carried out will be affected by whether the solute is attached to the solid phase or air phase, all of those will determine what this flux concentration is going to be. And that is, but then we have to see what model we want to use and so on. But all of them will play a role when we, when we actually write the governing equations. Governing equations will be in terms of bulk concentration, but fluxes are in terms of flux concentration. Any other questions? All right, we will stop over here and get. Not, uh, we'll break for tea now and come back just before 11 for the.